My name is Jeff Resnick. I'm Chief of the History of Medicine Division here at the National Library of Medicine. Thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon here in the NLM's Lister Hill Auditorium and those of you watching remotely and following us on Twitter using the hashtag NLMHistTalk. My colleagues and I <clears throat> are thrilled you can join us for the third annual NLM Michael E. DeBakey Lecture in the History of Medicine. This event is part of the NLM's 2019 History of Medicine Lecture Series, which is an annual program designed to promote awareness and use of the NLM Historical Collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment uh, of the NLM to recognize uh, the diversity of its collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the world. And also, of course, to appreciate the individuals of various disciplines who value these collections and use them to advance their research, teaching, and their learning. Today's program, like all of our lectures, is being live streamed globally and subsequently will be archived by NIH video casting. And both of these efforts are made possible uh, by a generous gift to the NLM by the Michael E. DeBakey Medical Foundation. And that is the gift which, in 2016, helped our institution to establish the NLM Michael E. DeBakey Fellowship in the History of Medicine and our annual DeBakey Lecture. The fellowship provides up to $10,000 to support the research, uh, research in the historical collections of the NLM, uh, which include, of course, the papers of Dr. DeBakey, representing the diverse areas in which he made a lasting impact, such as surgery, medical education, and healthcare policy, and much, much more. The NLM recently released its call for fellowship applications for 2020, and if you're interested to apply, visit the NLM History of Medicine Division website where all the details are listed, and the applications are due on September 30th. So really, what better way to spend your summer than thinking about the depth and the breadth of the NLM's collections and working on your application? So please do that. It's now my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Andrew T. Simpson. He is assistant professor in the Department of History at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And in 2017, he was one of our Michael E. DeBakey Fellows in the History of Medicine. He joins us today to share the outcomes of his research as they've taken shape in his forthcoming book entitled The Medical Metropolis, Healthcare and Economic Transformation in Pittsburgh and Houston. It's due out later this year from the University of Pennsylvania Press as part of its series on American business, politics, and society. Dr. Simpson's book, of course, reflects the focus of his current scholarship, which examines the relationship between cities and academic medical centers in the late 20th century United States. His other projects include work on the history of telemedicine, focused especially on the role of NASA, and on the history of emergency medical services here in the United States. He's published articles in the Journal of Urban History and the Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, and in that latter journal, uh, his article entitled Transporting Lazarus, Physicians, the State, and the Creation of the Modern Paramedic and Ambulance, 1955 to 1974, earned him the 2016 Stanley Jackson Prize for best article in that journal. Dr. Simpson has worked at, at, with Duquesne University's program for deliberative democracy to help foster dialogue around issues of resource allocation in public health emergencies, and he also teaches there at Duquesne um, courses on healthcare history, urban history, environmental history, and US and global history. Dr. Simpson is also a founding member of Duquesne's Terra Learning Community, a cross-disciplinary initiative which supports the exploration of past, present, and future extinctions through the lens of sustainability. And prior to uh, attending graduate school, Dr. Simpson worked in a variety of community development settings and on political campaigns. So please join me this afternoon in welcoming Dr. Simpson, who, deliver, who will deliver the third annual Michael E. DeBakey Lecture here at the National Library of Medicine, entitled Dr. Michael E. DeBakey and his influence in the changing business of healthcare and the delivery of American medicine. Well, good afternoon and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today um, speaking with you about Dr. DeBakey and his influence on the changing business of American healthcare and the delivery of American medicine. I also want to thank everybody for coming out on the Thursday before holiday weekend, so I very much appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Resnick and all of the staff at the History of Medicine Division for not only the invitation to come and speak with you today, 
but also for the opportunity to work with Dr. DeBakey's papers. Um, and I'd like to thank the DeBakey Medical Foundation in particular for their support of the DeBakey Fellowship, which as Dr. Resnick mentioned, please, if you have thought about applying for, definitely do, it's a wonderful experience. Um, but this fellowship allowed me not only to conduct the research for today's lecture, but also for the forthcoming book that, that Dr. Resnick mentioned, The Medical Metropolis, which is out hopefully later this fall with the University of Pennsylvania Press. So when we think of Dr. DeBakey and his relationship to the commercialization of American medicine, we often think of him as a staunch opponent, a defender of a seemingly older model of American healthcare that flourished in the brief period from the Second World War to the 1970s, and that was rooted in high-cost facilities, high-cost medical education, high-cost technology, and high-cost specialty services. And in fact, during Dr. DeBakey's life, he did much to publicly cultivate this reputation as this 1993 interview with the Medical News Network shows. Medicine had lost its luster. You see, as, as medicine became more and more uh, commercialized, it began to lose its sort of professional standing. And in that sense, the esteem of the public. And when it became advertised, that made it even worse, see? Uh, because it, it made it clearly evident to the public that this is a commercial venture. It's there, they're advertising. Now let me ask you, some people would say that you were one of the innovators in medicine as far as sort of high volume surgery. Uh, and yet now you're telling me the commercialization of medicine has been done but, but you've got to remember that, that, that we didn't commercialize. We didn't, we didn't advertise. The volume of surgery that, that I developed came about from people referring patients to me, doctors referring them, because of what we were able to present at scientific meetings and in publications, innovative developments in surgery. And so we were doing things nobody else was doing. Now, this public perception even spilled onto the pages of the New York Times in 1994 when he squared off against Dr. Denton Cooley in an article discussing the future of healthcare costs and the challenges of current clinical practice. Cooley, not surprisingly, was cast as an evangelist for medical efficiency through commercialization, whereas DeBakey once again assumed a foil role as a medical traditionalist. But while the idea of these two bitter rivals as emblematic of a deep division within healthcare might have made for good copy, it was not necessarily an accurate reflection of how either approached the changing business of medicine. Reviewing Dr. DeBakey's papers at the National Library of Medicine helps to complicate his relationship with the business of healthcare and the delivery of American medicine from the late 1990s, from the 1970s, I should say, through to the late 1990s, which is the focus of today's lecture. His papers show a medical administrator and a physician who had a far more complex understanding of where the American healthcare system and its, and its commercial imperative was heading during these decades than is often discussed. Perhaps then, instead of thinking of Dr. DeBakey as a defender of a particular model of healthcare, it might be more helpful to extend the entrepreneurial model that's characterized other parts of his career to this subject and to use Dr. DeBakey's relationship with the changing business of medicine as a lens by which we can study the evolution of our current healthcare system. After all, Dr. DeBakey was present and involved in many of the events that transitioned American medicine into an industry that became not just the heart of post-industrial service economies for many American cities, but also a global force that built international reputations and medical capacity. This is a topic that certainly needs more explanation, not just by medical historians, but by policy historians, business historians, and urban historians. Before we get too deep in the heart of the talk, it is worthwhile to take a moment to clarify terminology. Throughout this talk, I'm going to refer to Dr. DeBakey as a medical entrepreneur. And I want to be clear that I'm not conflating this term with medical capitalist. Both exist in the past, and they still exist today. Medical capitalists, of which we might hold Dr. Cooley up as perhaps an example, explicitly look to link the primacy of the free market and the free enterprise system with the delivery of medical care. Cooley, in fact, often stated that he wanted to be remembered as a, quote, Sam Walton of heart surgery. 
And in addition to Cooley Surgical First, he developed several key healthcare payment innovations that sought to reduce costs and increase surgic volumes. And at one point, Cooley even referred to some of these payment initiatives as one of his greatest contributions to medicine. Now, just because somebody's a medical capitalist doesn't mean that they don't care about the quality of patient care, are uninterested in groundbreaking research, or don't see a social value or responsibility in providing health care to as many people as possible. Cooley certainly believed in all of these goals. But rather, medical capitalists saw a critical role for the free market in providing medical services, with, of course, government regulation and certainly government-sponsored payment included. Medical entrepreneurs like DeBakey, however, had an opaque relationship with the balance between the medical free market and how care is paid for. For them, the primary discussion wasn't about issues of revenue generation or payment efficiency, but rather it was about three overarching goals. One, could people access the benefits of scientific medicine and advanced specialty care? Now, this didn't always mean that people would do it in the most cost-efficient manner possible, but rather that this care was available in the United States and globally. Two, was innovation broadly defined possible and ongoing? And this could mean innovation with medical procedures, but it also meant innovation with medical devices. Three, was there a healthcare delivery system that didn't adversely impact providers, hospitals, and medical schools while still serving patients? And this last one was perhaps the trickiest, especially for people like DeBakey, who operated both as physicians and as administrators. So today's talk is going to focus on three key parts of DeBakey's legacy of med medical entrepreneurship that reflect these three key questions. The first part of my talk will look at efforts to expand specialty medical care abroad and at home through the creation of specialty service lines, international consulting businesses, and DeBakey branded heart centers at two regional hospitals in the United States. The second part will look at his role in developing and marketing medical devices, especially ventricular assist devices through micromed technology. And the final part of my talk will conclude by looking at what his vision of a healthcare system should look like as set against the backdrop of Clinton era healthcare reform efforts in the early to mid 1990s. Since I'm going to be talking to you a little bit today about the way that the American healthcare system has evolved into an industry, I felt it was good to play economist for a moment and show you some charts. Um, Starting in the 1970s, um, total national health care expenditures were around $74,563,000, and that's the green line that you see on the chart behind you. Total hospital expenditures were around $27,168,000 of this total. Physician expenditures were $14,331,000. As you can see from the chart behind you, from both the green and the blue line, by 2017, this total had risen dramatically. According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, spending on health care rose to, quote, in 2017, reaching $3.5 trillion, or $10,739 per person. CMS reported that as a share of the nation's GDP, health care spending in 2017 accounted for 17.9%. CMS expects that by 2027, Healthcare spending will account for nearly 20% of the nation's GDP. So you can see the healthcare industry is a big and important part of our nation's economy. Now, most of this cost is driven by hospital and physician services, but medical devices, which we'll talk about today, also play a role. It is worthwhile to note that cost projections are a tricky thing. The major issue that currently complicates accurate cost estimations for the future is the potential of the repeal of the Affordable Care Act or the invalidation of the Affordable Care Act through lawsuit, um, and its replacement with a yet-to-be-determined framework for providing health care payment moving forward. But increasing medical costs are only part of the story. Medical historians like Rosemary Stevens, Kenneth Ludmer, and Beatrix Hoffman have provided excellent overviews of the role that hospitals, medical schools, and consumers have played in reshaping expectations for providers and for patients. And more recent scholarship is starting to examine how healthcare has intersected with urban development. Yet, as I mentioned before, there's still quite a lot of work to be done, especially looking at the first area that concerned Dr. DeBakey. 
how to make sure that access to specialty care was available to national and to global patient populations. As this clip from a promotional video for a DeBakey branded heart center in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which we'll return to in a moment, shows, he often argued that he, and by extension academic medical centers, had a responsibility to spread the benefits of scientific medicine far and wide. I think it's part of my responsibility as a teacher as well, and as a physician to expand the knowledge that we gain and provide that knowledge as far as we can to people all over. Now, actualizing this responsibility has correctly led many to regard Dr. DeBakey as a medical statesman. His travels globally to expand scientific knowledge helped to bring him in contact with royalty, with physicians globally, including behind the Iron Curtain, and even helped to build Houston into a major destination for international patients to travel to to receive high-quality, advanced specialty medical care. But what differenti differentiates his role as a global medical statesman from what we're going to talk about today is a growing importance of partnerships, often between for-profit companies, not-for-profit institutions, and even foreign governments to expand access to specialty medical care, starting really in the mid to late 1970s. A specific project where this type of partnership occurred was at the King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Saudi Arabia. This hospital was owned by the Saudi government, but managed by the for-profit Hospital Corporation of America. In 1976, HCA and the Saudi government approached Baylor for assistance with building an open heart surgery unit at the new facility and training specialized personnel. Now this public-private partnership model seemed to represent a win-win-win for how to export international health care abroad. Saudi Arabia was able to build their own advanced specialty medical capacity. HCA was able to profit and expand their overseas business lines. And Baylor could gain access to a patient population that would allow their trainees to sufficiently hone their skills in a manner similar to what more senior surgeons had experienced when they were training decades earlier in the United States. As Baylor surgeon Arthur C. Beale Jr. noted, quote, there are a large number of people with congenital heart defects like the backlog of patients in the U.S. in the 1950s when we started doing open heart work. But profit for HCA and training wasn't the only guiding principle, according to Beale. He later told the Houston Chronicle, quote, we've gone to Saudi Arabia because we were asked for medical help. We wanted to be of service. If somebody asked for help fixing a flat tire, you would help. Our motivation has been the same. Baylor's contract with the HCA Saudi program appears to have ended by late 1984 or late 1985. But throughout the rest of the 1980s and 1990s, Dr. DeBakey continued to export clinical and financial knowledge from Houston. He created or affiliated with at least two firms to build cardiovascular surgical capacity abroad. One was the DeBakey Consulting Group. Created in 1989, promotional materials for the company claimed it allowed DeBakey to, quote, formalize his commitment to advisory services by allowing him to, quote, combine his experience and leadership with the capabilities of a team of renowned medical professionals, who in turn are supported by the resources of several of the world's leading professional service firms. DeBakey Consulting drew its expertise from Baylor faculty and used the office of the chancellor as its official mailing address. Links to the private sector included healthcare planning firms like the Douglas Group of Deloitte and Touche and healthcare architects like Watkins, Carter, Hamilton. The company appears to have been particularly active in Turkey, working to plan a new teaching hospital. And the firm's advertised services included assisting with the architectural design of the hospital and working with the client to plan to, quote, recruit, train, and certify key staff for this tertiary hospital, which now serves as a referral center for many Middle Eastern and Mediterranean nations. Now, it's not clear what the financial arrangements look like for Baylor or for DeBakey but it appears that the DeBakey Consulting Group tried to merge the mission of the school to spread knowledge with the efficiency of corporate America to create new medical facilities overseas. In the late 1990s, DeBakey affiliated with yet another consulting group, DeBakey Prochaski Partners, LLC. This was a partnership between DeBakey, engineer and entrepreneur Georgia Sakim, and Anna Prochaski, an international business facilitator. The goal of this company was to seek out opportunities in developing countries to create specialized cardiovascular facilities. 
The services the company advertised that it would provide included construction, helping to match projects and financing, government relations with the United States to help secure foreign aid, contract negotiation services, on-site physician and staff training after the facility was built. It seems that the company's primary project was pitching to the government of the former Soviet Republic of Georgia to create a standalone cardiovascular care center. Now, existing records don't fully indicate if this project was successful or what role the company played in the developments beyond the proposal stage. Back in the United States, Debicki also worked through public private partner, through public partnerships to try to make specialty care more accessible in the United States, partnering with community hospitals to build Debicki branded cardiovascular care centers. One of the first community hospitals to do this was the Kenosha Hospital and Medical Center in Kenosha, Wisconsin in 1991. At first, Dr. DeBakey played the role of intermediary, connecting the hospital's CEO, Richard Smith, with consultants in Houston. But as the project developed, it appeared that DeBakey played a much more direct role in helping to build the hospital's cardiovascular surgical capacity. In that same video that we saw at the beginning of this, um, it notes that he helped design operating suites and recruited Dr. Robert Johnson from his Houston-based team to become the chief surgeon for the Kenosha Heart Center. But perhaps his most important contribution was convincing the hospital's board and Kenosha residents that a heart center in the community affiliated with Dr. DeBakey was worth supporting. The Hayes Medical Center in rural Kansas also sought DeBakey's endorsement for their new heart center. In 1998, representatives from that center made the trip to Houston to learn from DeBakey and the Methodist Hospital, although this trip now also included a delegation from Kenosha presumably to provide additional advice about what it was like to develop specialty lines in smaller markets. What did he get in return? Here again, the records are not necessarily clear. However, an unsigned contract with the Hayes Medical Center hints at some of the benefits and obligations. In return for an annual stipend of $30,000 and, quote, other valuable consideration, Dr. DeBakey would agree not to license his name to any other hospitals in Kansas, and would be held harmless for any legal liability incurred by the new heart center. As you can see from the newspapers behind you, Dr. DeBakey also traveled to Kenosha and Hayes, Kansas to promote the creation of each program and view each facility after it opened. In the end, what Dr. DeBakey's efforts to build surgical capacity in Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Georgia, Wisconsin, and Kansas show is that he understood that part of how American medicine was changing was that it required not-for-profits to forge partnerships, often with for-profits, to expand their brand presence, as well as other not-for-profits. In short, what he understood is that in a new, more commercial understanding of American medicine, building your brand required medical entrepreneurship. Now, I want to be clear. The ultimate goal for Dr. DeBakey wasn't about carving out market share, even if that might have been the case for his corporate partners. After all, there's truth to what he said to promote the Kenosha Heart Center about his responsibility and the responsibility of academic medical centers to diffuse knowledge. But he also understood that spreading knowledge required access to private markets to spread the reach of advanced specialty services. Thus, Dr. DeBakey understood the truism of medicine by the 1990s. Good medicine and good business appeared to be inexorably linked. A similar logic seemed to appeal to, uh, seemed to apply to how Dr. DeBakey and others like him approached the creation and the distribution of medical devices. Perhaps even more than the expansion of specialty medical care services, medical devices and biotechnology seem to have an almost intoxicating effect on civic elites and economic development professionals who are actively trying to figure out how cities like Houston could make the transition to a technology-focused post-industrial economy. The oil bust of the 1980s exposed a weakness in Houston's economic development organizations and their seeming lack of a diversified vision to help the city create a more robust economy that would be better able to weather the uncertain winds of its post-industrial future. For example, a subgroup of the powerful Chamber of Commerce seized on the idea of medical innovation as a potential pathway forward, arguing, quote, the world market for healthcare products in 1981 was $113 billion 
and is expected to have a compound real growth rate of 7% per year between 1981 and 1985, over three times the growth rate for oil field supplies and services. They continued, it appears that we have the resources to build new businesses and capture a larger share of the world market. It wasn't only the Houston Chamber of Commerce that was interested in medicine as a pathway to a diversified economy. Other groups like the Houston Economic Development Council, or HEDC, which broke away from the chamber due to their perceived inaction and was led by property development Kenneth Schnitzer, also stepped into the conversation, aggressively touting Houston's biotechnology and Houston's medical device sector as the pathway, or part of the pathway, to the city's new future. Baylor College of Medicine, of course, played an important role in helping to rethink what this economy should look like. And while DeBakey's colleague, Dr. William T. Butler, was the most actively involved with groups like the Chamber, Dr. DeBakey was probably the most prominent local and national and international face for Baylor. But despite key changes in patent law in the early 1980s with the Bayh-Dole Act, as well as changes in American tax law, which helped promote the growth of venture capital a few years before, commercializing technology development medical schools took time and did not always generate the results that scientists and administrators had hoped for. That doesn't mean, of course, that Dr. DeBakey wasn't actively researching medical technology. And in fact, since the 1960s, he'd actually been a leading figure in researching artificial hearts and ventricular assist devices. The artificial heart story has been well told by historians and participants, so I'm just going to avoid talking about it today. But its failure as a technology to emerge by the 1960s and the 1970s as a commercially viable solution left room then for ventricular assist devices to become a sort of wi more widely used technology. In fact, as early as 1963, Dr. DeBakey's team was implanting LVADs in patients in Houston. And by 1966, he successfully implanted an LVAD into the patient you see here on the screen. Throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, DeBakey continued to research into VADs as well as many others. And if you want to learn more about this, I strongly encourage you to check out some excellent work by the medical historian Shelley McKellar. Now, the roots of the DeBakey VAD, which are probably his most famous medical device, came about in the 1980s when Dr. DeBakey and Dr. George Noon performed a heart transplant on a NASA engineer named David Saucier, who you see pictured here. Following his surgery, Saucier believed that the technology developed for the space program could be applied to medical use. Now, this collaboration between Baylor and NASA built off not just the proximity of the two institutions in Houston, but also off of decades of existing work between the space agency and the medical school. It also built off a long-standing belief in NASA that space technology should and could be applied to terrestrial health problems. In order to further develop and market the DeBakey VAD, Micromed technology was created in 1995. The great innovation of this device was the axial flow pump that was used to circulate blood, and you see a picture of it here on the screen. There were a number of advantages to this design. The first was that the, the pump allowed the VAD to be much lighter and smaller than many of its competitors. Micromed claimed the VAD was, quote, one-tenth the size of currently marketed devices. And this was, of course, essential for long-term implantation. Another advantage was that the pump was made of durable titanium and was estimated to operate, quote, reliably for at least five years. Finally, the pump design seemed to not damage blood cells and cause additional complications. Micromed received an exclusive license from NASA in 1996 for the pumping technology at the core of the device. This company was led by longtime medical device executive Dallas Johnson and supported by a team that included NASA engineers who had worked on its design. DeBakey served as chairman of the Medical Advisory Board, also at times called the Scientific Advisory Committee, alongside Dr. Noon and a number of other eminent physicians and medical professionals. Micromed technology heavily marketed the connection between Dr. DeBakey, NASA, and the device. And while this pedigree was important, it was likely the promise of a vast commercial market that really helped to whet the appetite of most investors. In a 1997 video, we see that DeBakey spells out what the potential market for this device is. Now, he, you're going to see he doesn't frame this in terms of market terms, but this is certainly on the minds of many investors looking at putting money into this venture. Here is Dr. Michael DeBakey and Dr. George Noon. 
Well, the magnitude of the problem is, is really quite, uh, I would say, very great. It's almost enormous. Uh, there's some uh, 50,000 patients waiting for a heart transplant in, uh, in the world. And in this country, uh, only about 2,500 will get a heart transplant. About a third of the patients in, in our, on our waiting list die before we can get a heart transplant. Now, those are all patients that could use a ventricular assist device and ultimately could use it for, you know, permanent implantation. In addition to that, there's a large number of patients who undergo operation who can't be weaned off the heart-lung machine who also could use a ventricular assist device, there are thousands of those patients. More importantly, there are over 5 million patients in our country alone who are in heart failure. Each year, there's some 400,000 new patients in heart failure. And these are patients who could easily be helped by, very significantly, be restored to leading a reasonably normal life by such a device. So you see it's an enormous number of patients that could use this, this pump. Well, Dr. DeBakey cast his understanding of this clearly in medical and in human terms investors saw a real opportunity. In 1998, Schroeder Ventures Life Sciences estimated in a funding prospectus for Micromed that the potential market for the DeBakey VAD could be up to $5.2 billion. In order to reach their valuation, Schroeder estimated the average cost of a VAD implantation at around $85,000, with the total cost to the company of around $39,000. Others were even more bullish about the potential size of the VAD industry at large. For example, a 2001 report by Windhover Information, a private health services firm, estimated the theoretical markets for VADs at roughly $15 billion, up from a calculated $75 million. Moreover, Windhover was also particularly excited because they believed that products like the DeBakey VAD could create a whole new market. People who are ineligible for cardiac transplantation due to their age or due to other health-related factors. By 1998, Micromed was implanting devices in Europe, and four years later, the DeBakey VAD came to the United States. Globally, there were more than 450 implants of it and its successor devices by 2010. Now, Micromed's success helped to make Dr. DeBakey, Baylor, and Houston. It appears that Dr. DeBakey held a 3% equity stake in Micromed, and he seemed to be actively involved in securing a $500,000 sponsored research contract between the company and Baylor. Um, helping to further refine the device for U.S. markets. But once again, in sort of the medical entrepreneurship vein that I've been talking about, commercial success never seemed to be his main motivation. Instead, just like with efforts to expand specialty care, Dr. DeBakey understood that in the system of American medicine as it stood in the 1990s, the best way to get his technology out to save lives was to forge these partnerships to help a transition from the laboratory to the marketplace. Dr. Bakey's efforts to reform the conversation around healthcare represent a final critical area of medical entrepreneurship that this talk will examine. As a practicing surgeon and medical administrator, he had a unique perspective about how healthcare payment shaped not just the type of healthcare that was delivered to individual patients, but also how it affected the financial health of not-for-profit hospitals and medical schools. By the 1990s, his efforts to reform the healthcare system under President Bill Clinton and his wife, First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, appeared to gain steam. Dr. DeBakey entered the conversation, offering his perspective on the healthcare system's current state and his own proposed solutions for its future. His vision was, as his clip from the same Medical News Network interview we saw at the beginning of this talk shows, worried about some of the key tenets of the Clinton plan, and once again appears, at least on the surface, to defend this older high-cost model of medicine. The Clinton administration and others are now saying we need health care reform. Tell me how much you've been keeping up with that. What do you think about what's happening now and the big changes that are bound to occur? I call it uh, cost containment hysteria. I mean, it's, uh, you know, that, that's the buzzword, cost containment, what you can do to reduce the cost of medical care. And uh, it's reached a stage now where it's beginning to impinge on quality. That was my next question. We have real cost containment, which we have to have, 
and not damage the quality of medical care. Can't do it. Yet despite this very public pronouncement, Dr. DeBakey's understanding of health care reform and its relationship to medical commercialization is once again more complex than first meets the eye. Now, the 1990s wasn't the first time that Dr. DeBakey attempted to rethink what healthcare systems in the United States could look like. At roughly mid-century and deep in the age of American abundance, he chaired the President's Commission on Heart Disease, Cancer, and Stroke, which argued that the American healthcare system should focus on treating the much more visible and emerging, seemingly emerging problem of chronic disease. Now, the President's Commission understood that a mixed healthcare system with a commercial imperative was both the past present, and future, declaring the solution to the problems of heart disease, cancer, and stroke can only be built on the foundation of a profound and truly national commitment to this end by both public and private resources. The commission also claimed that, quote, the nation's strength derives from the strength of its people. A national investment in prolonging the productive life of its people pays rich dividends in national productivity. Good health is good business for the nation. Now, while this line wasn't necessarily designed to remind Americans about the growing business of medicine, which by the 60s certainly was emerging as a factor, it did nevertheless reminded the reader that, quote, the high level of health care now enjoyed by most of the American people has been built by a powerful alliance of public, private, and voluntary effort. And they argued that the way forward was that the federal government should step up, expend more money on biomedical research, medical education, hospital construction, without, quote, violating the basic conditions and freedoms of our existing health partnership. The optimistic tone and belief in the expanded role of the federal state as a conduit of increased money didn't last. I'm sure that's not a shock to anybody in this room. But the reorientation of American health care around chronic disease management and treatment did help to spike costs for consumers and contributed to a growing commercialization of American health care especially with its emphasis on a growing network of large not-for-profit and increasingly for-profit healthcare delivery options. By the time then that the Clintons introduced the Health Security Act, one marketing brochure for the plan declared that, quote, America has the finest healthcare doctors, nurses, and hospitals. But today, everything that is wrong with the American healthcare system threatens everything that is right. Now, the villain in this story was unrestrained private enterprise particularly insurance companies and drug companies, who, while never the object of much sympathy, were nevertheless cast as seen as overburdening beleaguered doctors and crushing the future of American patients. The solution to this, of course, wasn't socialized medicine, but rather managed competition, which was a market-oriented philosophy that promised to regulate the medical free market to advantage consumers and some providers, and would, at least in theory, keep the best of current practice and accountability while smoothing out the rough edges of the existing system. The Clinton's plan soon ran into a buzzsaw of opposition. It was seen as farcical by some, and if you look up here, this was a memorandum sent to Dr. DeBakey, which I found in his papers, explaining Bill Clinton's medical terminology. So go ahead and read that if you, if you want to have a laugh. Um, but many others saw it as pure and simple government overreach. The idea of managed competition, however, also raise questions about just how much the role of a private market versus state control should play in the delivery of medical care. Dr. DeBakey didn't hesitate to weigh in, despite, as he noted in a letter to consumer advocate Ralph Nader, that, quote, I have from time to time expressed my opinions, not all of which have been received with great enthusiasm. But even more than his surgical reputation, what gave Dr. DeBakey a sense of authority to speak on health care reform was his track record as a medical entrepreneur, somebody who had been involved in understanding new forms of medical care delivery, new forms of medical device innovation, and had a record as a medical educator and healthcare administrator. In 1993, Dr. DeBakey wrote to then director of the Office of Management and Budget, Leanne Panetta. Dr. DeBakey had met Panetta when he visited Houston, and the letter was a response to a request by the director for his thoughts on ongoing healthcare reform efforts. He said, I've had a long-standing interest in national health policy that would advance medical science, improve standards of medical care, increase the efficiency of health care delivery, and provide medical care for all people. But DeBakey argued that while such a program would be likely supported by Americans, he added a note of caution, saying, realistically, however, 
I have serious doubts that the implementation of such a national policy could be achieved overnight. I would therefore be inclined to recommend certain steps that can be taken incrementally. In the rest of the three pages of this letter are Dr. DeBakey laying out the steps that he wanted to take. At the heart of this, though, was a call that Dr. DeBakey made to protect the territory and the role of academic medical centers within the healthcare system. Drawing from his work on building centers of excellence as part of the Presidential Commission, Dr. DeBakey argued that investing in academic medicine would help to drive medical innovation and by doing so, reduce cost. Then he argued not-for-profit regional medical centers could help promote similar goals, especially around healthcare delivery. Finally, investing in technology like telemedicine and empowering paraprofessionals could not only expand access to care in underserved areas, but could also once again reduce the overall cost of care. So the blend of public and private that had underpinned Dr. DeBakey's vision in the 1960s was still at play in the 1990s. Although he did note in, the, in that letter to Ralph Nader that I had mentioned earlier that, quote, the commercial factor that extends across a broad array of individuals, institutions, and organizations such as physicians and other medical personnel, hospitals, insurance companies, medical equipment suppliers, and the pharmaceutical industry was, along with what he called increasingly intrusive government regulations, part of a number of factors that impinge on the whole fabric of healthcare activities. Here again, DeBakey argued in this letter to Nader for an expanded role for academic medical centers as part of his broader Center of Excellence idea, even going so far as to include newspaper clippings and excerpts from the Presidential Commission's report from the mid-1960s. One line is particularly striking. He wrote, there is much that is right with the American healthcare system and should be preserved. By the time the Clinton health care plan was defeated, however, many academic medical centers had already seized on key parts of Dr. DeBakey's ideas, whether or not they knew that they could draw a direct line to him or not. They embraced this type of limited and incremental reform and worked to get out front of potential policy changes so that they could retain their position as key drivers of health care change. Some, especially in Dr. DeBakey's own Texas Medical Center, likely went further than he was even comfortable with embracing a brand of medical capitalism that, as we've already mentioned, once again spilled out onto the pages of the New York Times. So it's worthwhile then to conclude this talk with a question. Why does understanding Dr. DeBakey's brand of medical entrepreneur entrepreneurship matter? I've hopefully made a convincing case to you today that the values that Dr. DeBakey espoused about healthcare and commercialization, about the power of partnerships to increase access to specialty care, both overseas in the United States, about the way that commercialization and innovation work together to create not just new medical discoveries, but also to ensure their use of patients that needed them, and about the relationship between government regulation and payment for the health system as a whole, are broadly reflective of how many Americans saw the evolution of the business of medicine from the 1970s to the 2000s. Thus, what Dr. DeBakey's story does for historians is it helps to create a set of sources and put a face on a very complex set of processes. And certainly Dr. DeBakey's career doesn't map perfectly to all of the changes in local, national, and international healthcare markets. But what his papers here at the, history, uh, here at the National Library of Medicine do is they lay out the outlines of a story that frankly needs more attention, not just by historians, but also by historically-minded policymakers. And I think this story matters because we're once again at a crossroads about what the healthcare sector means for local and national economies. As we're unsure if the Affordable Care Act will survive, and as more and more Americans, roughly 10,000 a day, turn 65 and require access to specialty care, we can see the ways that, the that our patchwork medical system works and the ways that it doesn't work. Think about this for a minute. Some of the most in-demand jobs in the United States today are nurses, paraprofessionals, and other healthcare-related professionals. Another growing field is health information technology and health-related services. Major tech companies like Apple and Uber are actively seeking to find new commercial inroads in these areas. Dr. DeBakey himself noted that healthcare employment mattered for the future of the post-industrial city. 
In an op-ed in the Houston Chronicle in May of 1993, he drew from Dr. Butler's analysis of the TMC's impact on the Houston economy. And he wrote the following, it, healthcare, represents the only sector of the local economy that's added jobs in recent years. This assumes greater significance when it's realized that almost all other sectors have downsized jobs and not infrequently completely closed down. In many areas of the country, these medical complexes and centers of excellence provide more employment than any other sector of the community. And of course, he went on to lament what Clinton's health care reform might do to these jobs. Yet, what Dr. DeBakey often sort of implied, and what we see in the growing sort of maturation of the healthcare system in, in, into an industry, was a sort of ambivalence with this idea of commercialization and a sort of understanding that the results of medical commercialization are mixed depending on how you're looking at a particular set of outcomes. But yet, medical commercialization brought with it a balm for struggling economies and in some ways reflects a sort of broader trajectory of American healthcare progress. And it's this that really sits at the heart of Dr. DeBakey's brand of medical entrepreneurship, not the quest for profit that characterizes medical capitalism. In the end, it's not clear of this entrepreneurial vision that created so many successes, yet came with so many high costs, can continue to function for the next century and beyond. So it's our turn now. It's our turn now to shape the business of American medicine and healthcare and determine how our values intersect with its future. Thank you so much for your time. Look forward to your questions. Ken. Thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Simpson. And before I ask my question, I'll just remind everybody in the audience, if anyone else has questions, make sure that you use the uh, microphone in front of you at the, uh, at the tables. Um, so, Dr. Simpson, I, I really appreciate your, your correlation of good medicine and good business and the, the link between good medicine and good business. But I want to, I'd like to ask for your thoughts on a, a third aspect of this, and that is good advocacy. And I, I would like to know if you see in your research, is there also a correlation between the, the, the financial gains that come from that good medical business and that, that medical commercialization? Do you see that reinvested into medical advocacy? Obviously, Dr. DeBakey was a, a, a very uh, successful medical advocate. I think capitalizing more on his fame and his connections to people in high places than on the financial success that he had. But I'm wondering, is, is there a connection? Is, are there examples of medical, successful medical commercialization being turned into successful policy advocacy? So I would say that that's a $64,000 question, but I think we're talking multiple billions now. Um, and I think that's actually a question that's really at the heart of how we understand what is the relationship of academic medical centers to communities. Um, in both Houston and Pittsburgh, which is the subject of my book, this question of whether not-for-profits are profitable charities or charitable not-for-profits comes up. And in particular, the argument made by many of these large not-for-profits is by generating a tremendous amount of revenue over expenses, we're able to reinvest it in things like medical education, we're able to invest it into advanced scientific research, and billions of dollars per year spent in community benefits. Um, how that is defined in terms of advocacy does raise questions. One of the big questions has been, are these employers paying living wages? Um, do community benefits really extend care to everybody? And that's actually something that large not-for-profit institutions have struggled with for a long time but it's really become particularly important in many communities now as we see that large institutions are often by far the largest employers. Um, and so I think that many individual physicians address this question of advocacy, and certainly Dr. DeBakey was very much concerned about expanding medical care, but he was also worried about what it would mean to expand medical care at the expense of cutting back on funding for academic medical centers. And so it really, is a, it really is a tricky question and it gets into how we want to set our priorities moving forward. And this is actually a debate that many communities, Pittsburgh in particular, has really been having over the last decade. Um, and it's one that I don't see going away um, over the coming decades. 
Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yeah, very interesting. I enjoyed that. I'd like to also, what maybe, I don't know if this really relates to any of your research, but how are you seeing some of these, like, you know, the Cleveland Clinic is set up, and I go out to the Middle East a lot, in UAE, and there's this new, uh, the new Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi and various places. Um, what, have you done any analysis or have a feeling for how, you know, a lot of these hospitals, if you will, or clinics have expanded overseas? Uh, have those been successful or uh, from the standpoint of, I guess, commercialization? I mean, they're obviously doing it to for, uh, promote uh, good health care, but uh, what, are they being successful in what they're trying to do? So this, is, this has been a mixed bag. Um, this is something I actually talk about in more detail in, in, the, forth, in the forthcoming book, um, which is looking at not just the sort of expansion overseas, but also the way that large academic medical centers you know, have been able to bring patients back to them. And for many years, that was the sort of model. Um, we create specialty service lines, we train physicians, and we build partnerships to bring people back to the United States. So to Houston for cardiac surgery, to Pittsburgh for liver transplantation, to Cleveland for coronary or bypass surgery. Um, over the last probably 20 or so years, we, we've seen this big expansion overseas. Um, sometimes ventures work out very well, Sometimes they don't, um, and it gets back to a degree to Ken's question, because it also raises questions about what happens when a large not-for-profit health system is expanding money overseas while closing underperforming hospitals back at home. Um, so I think this is an area that actually really requires a tremendous amount more attention. One of the things that was really interesting about Dr. DeBakey's papers here is finding information from the sort of 80s, 90s, and the 2000s about this is pretty rare. Um, and so Dr. DePakey's papers here at the National Library of Medicine actually offer a really interesting window into this internationalization of healthcare. But it's a subject that needs far more, far more work by medical historians. Since all the other microphones are broken, I'm going to, uh, going to <laughs> monopolize it. That's so, Thursday uh, before uh, a holiday. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you talked about the partnership that uh, uh, DeBakey and George Noon had with NASA. Uh, how do you see, so I, I would consider that a, a public-private partnership and that NASA is the, the public entity. Do you see those public-private partnerships uh, having an influence or an impact one way or the other on the success of the medical entrepreneurship? Um, you know, do they, do they lend themselves? I, I'm, as a, I'm looking mostly at like the military. There's mm -hmm. a huge, huge patient population in the military. I know there are a lot of uh, uh, medical entrepreneurial relationships between uh, pharma and, and medical uh, innovators in the military. And I think that there's some uh, uh, some transfer back and forth between technologies and, and methodologies between the military and some of these uh, uh, entrepreneurial medical enterprises in the private sector. And I'm just wondering if you've seen evidence of an impact, positive or negative, in those kinds of relationships. Absolutely. I'm going to kind of back up and answer your question in a little bit of a roundabout fashion. So NASA and Baylor have a long-standing relationship. Um, and it's not uncommon that the two institutions would seek each other out around issues of technology development and health. Um, and NASA also has a long-standing relationship with many institutions other than Baylor throughout the Texas Medical Center. Um, and if you go back to the Space Act, which founded NASA in the 50s, Part of the mission of the Space Act and embedded in the agency's DNA is really the transfer of space technology for civilian use. The roundabout portion of your question is one of the things we see, and I know the NASA story a little bit better than I know the military story. Um, we see, certainly in the 70s, NASA's working with both private sector groups, um, Lockheed and General Electric, as well as the Indian Health Service, to expand telemedicine capabilities. Um, and NASA does this because they're interested in a Mars mission. Indian Health Service is interested in expanding access to care. And everybody's being pushed by Richard Nixon to show that they can do something other than just their own mission at this point in time. 
Um, that sort of dies off by the 1980s, but we see that NASA is an agency that's very comfortable working across public and private partner partnership lines. And I think a good deal of te technological innovation comes out of that. It's not always distributed, maybe, in the most sort of economically just way, um, but in some ways, too, um, and this is a, a project that we've done some, I've done some writing on with some collaborators from NASA. It's called StarPAC, Space Technology Applied to Rural Papago Healthcare in Arizona. But we see that actually there are some people who really do need medical technology. And that spawns a variety of things, at least for the Papago, it spawned job training, um, now the Toto Odom people. And so there is this sort of partnership moving forward. Interestingly enough, um, because of the Houston connection, uh, there's J uh, the Johnson Space Center is involved in this as well, and we see a variety of other things here. I will say that I think there needs to be more research, certainly within business history and within the history of medicine, on the way that public-private partnerships come together. Um, part of the problem is, again, accessing records. Oftentimes, the public records are either not available, haven't been processed, and the private records are non-existent. So I think as historians of the late 20th century really are creative, use collections like Dr. DeBakey's, which include a pathway into some of these records, we're going to be able to see really what the sort of complexity of the sort of federal state, but also the sort of agency level relationship to commercialization, to broader health goals, to broader goals of social justice looks like. Um, and I think there's just a lot of room for historians to really dig into this and tell a really complex and nuanced story. Thank you very much. I'm gonna ask my question from over here. Um, so with this idea of medical entrepreneurship, is that kind of one of those more uniquely American ideals because of socialized healthcare in Europe? And like, how does that compare in the mid 19th century? That is a fantastic question, and I'm going to plead that I'm an American historian, so I don't know that I can fully answer that. I think there is to a degree, though. There's something sort of unique about the period after the Second World War when we see a willingness of physicians in particular, um, but also large institutions, to really forge some, some innovative partnerships. And part of it's out of desperation. Um, by the 70s and the 80s, as you see the fear of managed care potentially cutting into people's not, I wouldn't say profits, but revenue. Um, you see that people are looking to sort of find a way to replace that revenue. Part of it is also an understanding that just the way the American economy seems to be working in these decades is if you want to get something out, you've got to get it out on the commercial market. And I think that's why we see Dr. DeBake in particular looking to market medical devices in this way. Um, but he's certainly not the only one. And we sort of, you know, I hate to bring up Dr. Cooley at, at a lecture about Dr. DeBakey. Um, but Dr. Cooley in particular, and I, I talk a good deal about him in the book, he was really particularly interested in not just finding ways to make profit at medicine, but to find a way to deliver care more efficiently. And he created a, a managed care organization called Cardiovascular Care Providers, which is still in existence today, that helped to lower the cost of cardio. It actually went to big Houston companies and basically sold them a package of services for, for cardiovascular care provision. And he has referred to in several instances, this might be one of his, he says this might be one of my biggest contributions to the history of medicine. That seems to be a, a very much a US-based story, and it seems to be very much a post-war story. I'm not certain I can fully address the transnational nor the 19th century component of your question, so I apologize for that. But thank you for your question. Thank you so much for your talk. And thank you uh, for speaking so eloquently as a historian um, about like the use of the archive. Um, and on that point, I have a softball question, but a selfish one. Uh, so as a current DeBakey fellow, I haven't dived into this collection yet, but when you were here, um, reminisce a, a moment, please, um, and tell us what was like your favorite find? Uh, what got you excited? Because you know, there are hints of this. I just kind of want to know more. So my favorite find, was this. I was absolutely fascinated to get a chance to see that Dr. DeBakey had been, and I knew there was sort of internationalization. I knew what had kind of happened in, happened in Saudi Arabia had come across this. But to see that Dr. DeBakey was actively involved in creating these consultant groups, that was just a moment where I'm like, this is a really cool thing that I need to add in. Um, and, and 
I, I think what was really helpful was um, having the time to come down and to look through this through the, through the Debakey Fellowship. Um, I think my sort of second find, and something I would encourage current Debakey Fellows to do, is the video collection. Um, there's really an extensive video collection, including an interview from the 1990s, a primetime live episode around tax exemption in the Methodist hospital that I've never been able to find anywhere else that's here in the collection. So it was really cool, and I was excited to be able to see it. Um, it is an interesting collection because the bulk of Dr. DeBakey's papers are currently being processed at Baylor. But what's here is really a, a unique window into not just a surgical practice, but who he was as an individual, as an advocate. Um, and so it's a really nice way to be able to see that. So awesome, and I'm really glad to meet you, and I'm glad to see the DeBakey fellows in attendance. Yes, sir. I think also, I, and I think I have a copy maybe, I think he also had a proposal in at one time with Azerbaijan. Okay. Uh, and I think it was going to be funded by U.S. government AID or something. I don't know what happened with that. I just happened to come across it a few years ago through a friend of mine in Azerbaijan who was aware of that project, uh, which was interesting that this was Georgia and this other one was Azerbaijan. The question I just wanted to ask you, uh, getting back to the Middle East again, is uh, Dubai, uh, I know it spent a lot of money in health care, and they bring in a lot of these countries bring in people, you know, they don't have all the foreign talent, doctors, other professionals, if you will. Uh, I guess down the road, looking out 20 years from now, I, I get the impression that Dubai is trying to become a center of health care, and that Europeans and others from Asia may go there instead of the U.S., do you get a sense from uh, the medical industry in the U.S. that that would take business, if you will, away from them, that that's going to become a health care center? You know, I, that's a great question, and I'm not 100 percent certain. Um, if I look back to sort of the example that we had here with, with Saudi Arabia, um, from what I can see from the limited amount of materials I found on this, there certainly needs to be I mean, more comprehensive work done on this. This was largely an effort by the Saudi government to really set up a sort of homegrown medical industry, eventually. Um, and I think that is important. Um, one of the things, you know, I, I think remains to be seen in the U.S. is what the future of healthcare investment is going to look like. And I think depending on how we choose to prioritize medical education, how we choose to prioritize research and development, how we choose to prioritize training, that's really going to be something that's going to shift. We're certainly seeing much more competition for medical care and medical education. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't know that I can totally answer your question about where we're going to be in, in 20 years. I'm going to fall back on my, my standard line. This is a wonderful thing about being a historian as I get to look at the past. And, well, I will say that historians are terrible prognosticators. That doesn't stop us from doing it anyway. But um, I think it really will be an interesting, an interesting area to watch. Um, and to your point about Azerbaijan, one of the things I think that's important, too, is that as historians, we're limited by the sources that we have. Um, and this is one of the challenges with contemporary history in particular. So the more sources we can get available, the more things that we can find, um, the more complex and nuanced and richly detailed the stories are that we're able to tell. Thank you. Dr. Simpson, on behalf of the National Library of Medicine, I want to thank you very much for an outstanding third annual Michael E. DeBakey lecture. We wish you every success in your continued research and your forthcoming book, which we all look forward to reading. Well, thank, thank you, you all very much. I very much appreciate you being here, and thanks to Jeff and the History of Medicine Division and the DeBakey Foundation for generously supporting the DeBakey Fellowship. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.